G'day guys, welcome back in. You know what's really funny is I did my best to get the best possible Wi-Fi that the world could ask for. No joke, no word of a lie. I have a Starlink set up beside me right here. And it's told me, are you sure you wanna use that? Because your regular cellular, da cellular data might be better. So, we actually uh, threw in the towel on the Starlink, which is wild. Um, but here we are. We're gonna see how we go. Mm -mm -mm -mm. There we go. Right. No time like the present. Massive canvas. We're using. <laughs> thank you. We're using egg tempera. We've got two plates, three plates, a bunch of pigments and little containers, a picture that we're going to make up here, on here. Now the big difference between this one and the normal ones we work to is that this one is sanded to 600 grit. I'm quite sure what that means, but 600 grit makes it much, much flatter. I don't know why they call it 600 though. Um, and you have to bear with me, if you notice that my voice is a little bit off, I'm actually a little bit sick right now, which is okay. You won't get a virus through the phone. I mean, it's unlikely you would, but but this could be a possibility. Anyway, just bear with me if I'm a little bit softer on voice. Period 600 grit. Yeah, so 600 grit. Does anyone know why we call it 600? Is it because it's like 600 bevels per inch or something? I got no idea. I just know that the uh, more, the higher the number, the softer the sandpaper. So like 80 is really, really rough. You don't want 80 um, if you're trying to make things really smooth. Of course, you start with 80 and then you go to 150, 200, 300, all the way to 600. So this is as smooth as a porcelain plate, which allows the paint we're about to put on it to flow really nicely, flow really well. And that's the plan. It needs to flow well. Needs to flow well. Right. Speed up page. Put that down there. First brush. Look at that for a weapon. All right. Just got this absolute weapon today, so I'm excited to give this four pronged. Weapon a go. G'day Steve. Ugh. Depends what the first color is going to be though, that's the question. We'll go with this one. So inside here, g'day David. Inside here is a pure pigment. And the way we're going to happen, the way we're going to make it work, is I've got in this my egg tempera mix. The reason it's in this and not a regular container is the thermos keeps it cold. The last thing I need is to paint with an omelette. I need to be painting with fresh egg. So this keeps it nice and cool. Or hot, depending on the temperature of the thing you put in there. There we go. Now a couple of ways to mix egg tempera. One way is to delicately do it with a palette knife. We've done that before. The other way is to put it into a container and shake the hell out of it. Beat the devil out of it. And if you shake it up like this, you'll get that dispersion of the pigments, but you won't have to deal with the powder of it to put yourself at risk. So, do you want bubbles or to deal with powder and mash gently? I find I like this because it gets you in the mood a bit more. You kind of feel like Dr. Hook from Little Sister. Please, please, please. Sorry, I do though. It's like a little, it's more Billy Ocean actually. Who uses those things? They kind of went out of fashion in the 80s. I could do that in a band though. I could just stand there in the corner and just shake it. I reckon I'd be good at that. <clears throat> Why egg and not acrylic? Katie, great question. Why egg and not acrylic? 
So egg tempera dries via a different mechanism. It's an emulsion, so it forms a thin layer on top and inside the egg yolk, as those uh, fats bind together, the fats and the proteins, it seals the pigment into a um, permanent film. Now, acrylic and oils actually yellow over time. Acrylics because they're full of plastics and oils because naturally the linseed oil or even walnut oil will just eventually yellow. Something about life, something about an egg means that it doesn't do that. It literally just remains constant provided it's in a safe environment borderline indefinitely, easily 600 years. So, since it's a different drying mechanism that not only is archival, but it doesn't, it means it's not off gassing, it's better for our health. And excuse me if I lose my trail of thought, I'm, <laughs> I'm a little sick. But, uh, so it's better for the artist, it lasts longer for the collector, and it allows us to get more um, engaged with our medium. With acrylic, you buy a tube, squirt it out, apply it. With this stuff, you make it. There's a passion or a romance to the actual paint you make. And that connects the artwork with the artwork, with the artist with the artwork even more. A lot of artists are going, oh, how can I get more connected with my work? Make the paint, make the paint. Great way to start. G'day, Justin, Yandel and Richards. Two Justins for one. What are the chances? That two comments back to back are two Justins. I like that. All right. We're going to try this monster of a brush. Oh, baby, baby. One thing you'll notice too, if you're still here, was it Rachel? And excuse the easel, it's a bit shakier than the usual ones. One thing you'll notice is even though that's dry brushing, and it's not that much, that was one load on the brush, the saturation, because we've used uh, the pigments ourselves and haven't sort of used any fillers, the saturation absolutely pops an unstoppable amount of power behind these colors. <laughs> we got a big team here. G'day guys, how are we doing? <laughs> like I was saying, bear with me team. I am <clears throat> I'm not in excellent health. So we're out here painting and playing around with egg tempera, but uh, your artist uh, is losing his voice a little bit. So I thought I'd come in here anyway, hang out with paint, but uh, look, if you get a few little coffees and uh, a few little coughs and a few little uh, um, lost trail of thoughts, it's okay. Seb's doing his best. I heard the egg temper cracks easier as it dries. Do you do anything with the canvas to prevent? Yeah, you don't use canvas. The reason it'll crack is because your surface is not solid. This surface is masonite, so it's not flexible. Egg tempera dries into a flat strong film if the surface flexes like this what's going to happen that film is going to crack so if you want to avoid that from happening the egg tempera the old masters would work on wood and they'd work on i think stone clayboard's the best but i prefer the raw feeling of wood oh sorry clayboard's the best because you don't need to prime it <clears throat> it's already good to go i prefer to go to the process of priming I feel more connected to the actual wood than I do to clayboard. Clayboard feels quite synthetic, but it is the best. But I try and avoid the synthetic stuff. I like a more raw approach, guys, you know that. Um, but yeah, it's prone to cracking if you don't know what you're doing. Just like acrylics prone to drying darker, Acrylics, uh, oils are prone to splitting sometimes, taking forever to dry. Like every paint has its prone to X, Y, and Z. All completely addressable in their own different ways.
If you want to join me, you may have noticed when I started the session, I chucked in an AirPod. It's just to keep me uh, the bounce of my step while I'm trying to get over this little uh, sore throat. So if you want to join me on the playlist and match my vibe, <clears throat> we're listening to uh, Enya. So I'm listening to Sail Away right now. Started on only time. All right, quick question, and then I'm diving back into it. Thanks, Ziki. You're a legend. Um, Seb, quick question. How do you, how much do you, or what range do you usually sell your paintings for? David, they vary. And one of the things I try and do is make sure there's something for everyone, because one of the things, one of the core values that I have is making art accessible for everyone. So at the base level, there's things like uh, the digital artwork that's available for you to actually buy and then shop for your own print, uh, sorry, frame at an op shop and um, print it out when you can afford it in your own way, which gives you full control for the lowest cost I can give it to you for. And then that goes all the way up to things like prints, which get up to around half a thousand dollars. And then that goes all the way up further than that to originals, which can get, they can get right up to there to like 15, 20 K. Um, smaller ones can get there around the sort of several hundred to a few thousand mark. But the problem with originals for everyone is that there's costs like shipping that come into it. And if you've seen those protective crates that I build, um, surfaces, especially for egg tempera, they need preparing seven to eight times, six to seven times each with their gesso. It's a unique kind of gesso that's more absorbent so the egg tempera sticks to it. Um, you got the cost of the resources and then, yeah, just things get expensive, guys. Originals are expensive. <laughs> I hope that, I hope that answers. I hope that answers the question, but basically my goal will always be to have something for everyone. I think that's really important. Owie. Let me just scroll back up there and catch up. And then I'm diving back into this painting, guys. Georgie, is it the same spot you did the tree painting the other day? Yeah. Yeah, really close to it. A little bit further back, only because I tried to set up a Starlink to give me a bit of Wi-Fi. Couldn't connect to it, so we're just on regular cellular data right now. Breaks my heart a little bit. I really tried, guys. There's a literal Starlink on the lawn here that I thought, yeah, great reception. Didn't work, didn't work. Thanks heaps, I just paint with acrylic for fun, but I've wondered how to stop fading. Katie, if you go for egg tempera, you'll have way stronger colors, but you need to put it behind a UV glass shield so it protects it over the course of time. It'll look beautiful when you start, but, but if you actually, um, if you, 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 it'll look beautiful when you start. Um, what am I trying to say? Your acrylics, sorry, I'm trying, I keep bringing things, everything back to egg tempera. For you, if you're using acrylics and you're finding the fading, you need to varnish your acrylics and you can use a whole bunch of things for that. If you're short on budget, shellax works fantastically. It's made out of crushed beetles from Africa. I think. It's about out of crushed insects. I think they're beetles. Beetle wings. I forget. That's the cheapest option. And that works kind of as a uh, varnish. Or, or, you've got your um, regular off-the-shelf varnishes. Just give the acrylic painting time to fully cure. A touch dry isn't enough. It needs to fully cure. So if it's a thin layer, a couple of weeks should be fine. If you're doing really thick acrylic paintings, you've got to let that painting dry the whole way through. Otherwise, when you put the varnish on, moisture is going to get trapped between the varnish and the paint. And if moisture gets stuck under there, that's a recipe for disaster for long-term archiving. Okay. Okay, question was... What? Yeah, sorry, keep going. Sorry, I got caught up in the uh, questions there. And the problem was I had a uh, hot chocolate that I was sipping on there too, which honestly made it more exciting to stay up there closer. But <clears throat> point being, guys, any questions you have about technicalities or craft when it comes to art, egg, tempera, acrylic, oils, whatever, you can honestly ask the free version of Chatbot GPT, and it'll give you all the same answers I'm saying in a probably more articulate, less forget your trail of thought kind of way. So 
on one hand, you want to ask the artist, I get that. On the other hand, trust me when I say I'm probably outgunned with knowledge. Me versus chatbot GBT on art methods. I just think chatbot will beat me. So if you've got questions about your own art craft, you can message me about it. But I'm better on the emotional stuff, guys. We will get so hung up on our medium method of which we paint with. How about how you feel when you paint? How do you approach your craft with feeling? How do you care about what you make? What's your why? Do you actually have a why? If you don't have a why, it can get pretty tough, pretty hairy, pretty fast. And it can be basic too, guys. It doesn't need to be a ridiculous, powerful, compelling, God-like why. It can just be something very simple. I want to make people happy. But then when you start your work, lead with that. Lead with intention. Because your work's going to wear your intentions, whether you know what that is or not. So, <clears throat> try and figure it out. So that when your work actually holds that intention, it's what you meant for it to have. It's supposed to make other people happy. Make it wear that. Make it own that. Who knows what we're doing yet? Oh, you can definitely see that. It's a face, guys. <laughs> I thought, yeah. Big face. Um... Janice, welcome on in. Great to have you here. Jesus, welcome on back. Manny, well, we love to have you here. This is an inclusive environment. Be constructive. We don't want to make fun of people here, regardless of who they are. <clears throat> and if anyone new is just joining us, I normally don't sound this laboured. I'm just a little bit sick. Looks amazing, you just got in. Don't worry, you only missed the first jeepers. Three minutes. We've literally just been going at it with this monstrously sized brush with the old uh, four separate barrels. Triple barrel brush action. The other problem too is, guys, in New Zealand, I don't think we have access to things as strong as the Americans have for dealing with flus. I remember I got a flu over at Camp America in the States, in Maine, and the nurse in the infirmary gave me something that actually, whoa, it shook up my world. That uh, got rid of the cold and made me feel great. Nothing in New Zealand really does the same thing for me. Down. Oh, I've, uh, we're taking it easy on me. I've got six colors, so that's number one. Um, I should mention we might bring back colors if um, I need to add in different hues of them. So, sorry, hues, tones. So, I've got a little bit of that blue left, and I've got a big tub of white. So, every time one of those gets low, I can throw some white through it. We'll never get that level of saturation on blues again, not this session, but uh, yeah, we can definitely do a more lighter toned version. No black, no black today. This blue is as dark as we're going. Just want to point that out. No deeper. No deeper, baby. Okay. Yeah, Janice, me and you. Kindred spirits of the viral, of the virus. 
Um, <laughs> it's not fun. It's not fun. It makes life difficult. Um, Look the other way. Now, we've got a little tool here that you haven't seen before. Let me give this a bit of a go. What this does is egg tempera needs to go on thin layers. So, this is a very, very strong brush. It's actually if you're going to be technical, this is for doing dishes with an eco-friendly device. But I'm going to use this in the thicker areas. And what it's going to do is pull off any thicker areas of egg tempera to allow it to dry in that thin film. It has to dry in a thin film. Otherwise, like we talked about before, was it Rachel? It'll crack. You don't want that. Now, I don't always do this, but... When I'm feeling less slick way to get around that. See that stroke there? Way too thick. That wasn't going to dry very well. It would, but not after the second, third or fourth coat. There we go. One day we'll do some uh, close-ups of what this all looks like but effectively guys not a lot of paint actually comes off but you push it out so where there is mounds of pigment it spreads allowing it to dry better cheers Vernon all right fresh plate pink welcome in thermos this one goes in here like this. Mm, maybe a little bit more. There we go. Now, egg tempera will last for... Look, they say 48 hours. Some people say they add um, vinegar to it to make it last even longer. <laughs> Cheers, Vernon. But, look, I don't do that. I just do a raw mix, usually one-to-one. -one. It's about 6 p.m. here, so we get quite a lot of light later in the evening. Um, but I don't add in any, any vinegar. I just don't want a bar of it. I want to use it right when I make it. But you do get, you get 48 hours. But so you've always got a margin of error. I say 24 hours. Um, so we can make it tonight. And if we don't use all of it, I've got tomorrow morning to use up some more of it. Hi Priestess, welcome in. What's the, uh, what are the stars saying today? Give me some good news. Are they gonna tell me I'm gonna get over my flu in the next uh, 48 hours? Please, do me 12, do me 12. Julio, welcome from Texas, USA. Texas is home to some of my favorite original works. Um, I shouldn't say that, but some really cool ones. Um, Alexander the Great is in Texas. And uh, 700 Springs Ranch is in Texas. A couple of landscapes go to Texas. Texas likes landscapes and then really bold work. You guys, you guys like the uh, beautiful, expansive landscapes and then the really bold, like um, not controversial, but bold statement pieces. That's what I see in Texas. It's the eclipse, babe. Oh no, I'm sorry, you're under the weather. <laughs> So, Hi Priestess, talk to me like I'm six. What, what does this mean? What does this mean for us? Vernon, you're a legend, mate. Okay. Now, guys, this next color, real different. We've never used this color before. Well, not for a very, very long time. This is iridescent gold. So it's literally the color that you'd expect gold to be if you were panning for it. 
I never normally used it, but uh, that's mainly because the oil and acrylic versions of it just dry a bit tacky. But with mixing the pigments yourself, they come out a bit more poppy. Beautiful. <clears throat> All right. Lovely bit of gold over the top. Oh. I'm digging all the blues lately. I'm glad you're loving them. Me too. Well, I need to know your moon sign. Seriously, I'm studying medical astrology. I graduate this year. That's fun. I don't know what my moon sign is. Um, 12th of January for a birthday though, 1993. So I'm 31 years old. Graduating to 32 in four months. Pretty exciting. And thank you, Pearl. Pleasure having you here. I'm glad, I actually am very glad you're here. I'm just a little bit sick, so. If it sounds like I'm laboring as I say these things, it's not because I'm uh, not super excited you're here. I'm just a little bit sick. <laughs> um, I would love to see the finished painting of the one that I said, reminded me of Dalai Lama. I'm trying to remember. We've had a lot of paintings on the go at the moment. Uh, a lot of them have been experiments with certain techniques. So we'll get it halfway there and examine how it looks. Um, and so sometimes I don't go the whole whole nine yards. They're just there to test certain theories that I've got about color matches, layers, thickness, composition. And then we go, right, that works. 
now onto this piece. Um, yeah. Anyway, coming on down here. Yes. Blackheart likes painting. Lion King. Interesting. I like that. 1992. No, 1993. I'm just a baby. Last week. Delhi Lama from last week. <laughs> it's so pr Oh my god, it's New Zealand. It's always pretty out here. Next color, phthalo green, and it's gonna party with uh, all of those blues. So it's very, very similar in terms of, yes, 1993 baby, too right. It's a very similar hue, uh, sorry, tone to the blues, but it's actually a uh, slightly off hue on the green field rather than the blue. So what we're gonna do to create some separation between the two is I'm going to get a smaller brush and basically notice the exact same things but since the brush is smaller it's going to actually fall within the blues to create some more deeper cut lines we don't need whites yet whites are already kind of in there in the areas we haven't touched what we do need is the wrinkles and the uh, evidence of life in this man's face as the blend Waylon, I'm doing fantastically. Question is, do we go for the 63 millimeter? Nah, we'll do the 50. This is what we're after. It's kind of uh, out of rhythm. I'm listening to Anchor Me right now, but I'm shaking a bit fast. Middle of your deep blue sea. And uh, ooh, because we used up all the uh, gold, we're going to use the same plate twice. It's already good. <laughs> Taylor, you got some boots like mine. Lucky you, Taylor. What a treat. Um, red bands, classic. All right, and uh, it's so pretty there. You want to visit sometime. New Zealand is a good place for a holiday, guys. Very safe, nothing dangerous here. Everything's pretty safe. Hey, do you mind, guys? Can I bring you closer? Bring you to here. How's that? Wonderful. Greens, eh? 
I like your style. I like your style. You see, the only reason I've got the Stalo Green is to pair with the blues by itself. I always feel like it comes off naked, but uh, paired with the blues, powerful, always powerful. But you can just see the uh, potency and the colors I can get with the egg tempera because of how much pigment I can add, but also, also no fumes for starters and I actually don't use a whole lot of paint so it's actually if you're concerned about paint consumption egg tempera is a bit of a winner because it actually although it has so much pop it's a very thin glaze of it one after another so we don't use up more than we need eco-friendly but also pretty good even if it wasn't eco-friendly it wouldn't use up too much paint like other mediums will the only one that could really compete with egg tempera if you ask me the only one that could really compete for usage would be something like ink which just goes on so thin but uh, apart from ink you've pretty much got a winner All right. You like it so far? So far, so far. Yeah. Me too. I'm a Virgo moon and you are too. That's exciting. Look at us go. Two little Virgo moons hanging out on the TikTok stream. Like I mentioned earlier, this is the plan. Lots of earth energy. Well, we're using earth pigments, which is wild. I've always had a preference for these pigments that are actually from the earth. And where you can, not synthetically made. It's not always the easiest thing, but uh, natural earth pigments. And earth pigment has a different definition because you think, well, everything's from the earth. That's true. With earth pigments, it's actually an art term where you mean uh, minerals and clays specifically. Um, there's, a, I forget exactly, I think it's soil and clay only. There's some sort of definition for it. I think it's soil and clay only. Um, so when an artist says earth pigments, they don't just mean any pigment from the earth. 
only mean things found in a certain way. Hello, Joe. Welcome in. Aquatic mystical vibe. Let's see if we can keep that pink. I like that. It's uh, about 6 p.m. right now. is a brush in between this one and this one that's a bit of a step <laughs> you should always uh, when I use all these different kinds of brushes I try and uh, reduce the size by about 20 to 30 percent each brush so that there that's reducing it by like five times if not maybe six so that's too big a jump there should be about four brushes in between these two so there's going to be an awkward jump when we go from large down to small. It's okay though. Now that I've pointed it out, it's way less awkward. And hello, LJ. Welcome in. Welcome in. LJ, bear with me. I've been complaining about it, but I'm just a little bit sick at the moment. For those who've been here since the start, they'll be like, okay, let's stop going on about it now. I reckon I'll be, it was the last two days and today, so I think I'll be pretty much over it by tomorrow, I'm thinking. But like, we'll see. Actually, guys, I'm going to leave you here for a moment. I just realized I've got the perfect brush for this. Give me a moment.
Right. Weird sounding bird that you love. That sounds exciting. Um, ooh, ooh, I left my AirPod out. I better not forget that, otherwise it'll uh, rain and I'll forget where I put it. All right, now we're back with everything. So this is the little brush I was looking for. So it's much smaller, but actually the amount of bristles on this is perfect for detail on this. It's gonna save us a bunch of time. Um, the gloves as well, they, they are because I'm getting a lot of those pigments on my hands and Ideally, you don't want that. Not because all pigments are super toxic, but actually, the annoying thing about them, they dry your hands out. And I'm not big on dry hands. Neither shall we. Now I want something pretty different. Let me just get the last of this off. All right. Oh. Got Brett Eldridge in my ear right now, singing Beat of the Music, baby. How long does it take you to paint a canvas of this size on average? About six to 10 hours. It used to be about 20 hours, but uh, I've got better. Um, six to 10 hours. And on top of that, I'll say this last little bit for white. Uh, but it's not non-stop six hours. It's stop every 30 minutes to an hour. Step back and reevaluate before re-engaging. So it's more fair to say, it's much more fair to say uh, seven, to, seven to eight layers is usually fair. Some of them are just small, 30 minutes, duh, and just step back and see how you feel. Some of them are massive. Sometimes we'll do four hours on a piece and then to get to the finish line there's a whole bunch of 15, 30 minute sets. Every painting is different. One size fits one, in all honesty. High Priestess, one size fits one. We don't want to start thinking for one second that uh, you can just apply the same template to every picture, because it doesn't work. You just need to settle for the fact that every time you start a new piece, you've started a new journey 
with something, but kind of someone new. And the moment you stop doing that, art loses its fire, its zest, its juice. It just becomes generic craft. We want that uh, new, novel, different, special art. It doesn't have to be different for the sake of it, but if it's a new journey, it will be a little different. And hey, Dr. Arthur, welcome in. Deborah, hello, welcome in. You're all good. Most of my, uh, even a lot of my relatives, Deborah, will call me Zeb. So, I honestly don't mind one little bit. I also get Sid. I don't like Sid so much because uh, it reminds me of the uh, sloth from Ice Age. But uh, we get it all. Who else do we have here? G'day Devon. Welcome in. Now, the colors you're liking right now, and bear with me while my voice is a bit different. We're making these from scratch. So, I've got pigment powders. We're splicing the pigment powders into, uh, pigment powders into egg tempera, which is literally egg yolks, and painting them. Sounds weird. Last for 600 years. It's the go. Last Supper, Egg Tempera. I think it was at the uh, birth of Aphrodite. Egg Tempera. It's a great, great method. Plus, no solvents, fumes, or anything dangerous. Both for the artist and collector. Because a lot of artwork actually sells before it's properly cured. Which means that actually the collectors got an item sitting in their house which is literally releasing all sorts of nasty volatile organic compounds and they're like i love my piece why do i feel ill <laughs> shouldn't laugh but like that's the game yeah so egg temper can take a little bit of time to cure but actually while it's curing it's forming a binding surface and not off-gassing at all. It evaporates the water, but actually it coagulates on the surface. Very, very different mechanism. Off-gassing should be a red flag. Or at least, at least a beige flag. Let's get a bit more on this. Gonna be naughty with this last little bit of titanium white. I'm just gonna pour it straight on the plate. See that? Naughty, naughty, naughty. You can't trust artists like me. 
One moment you're saying shake it in the containers, the next moment he pours it straight on the plate. How do you listen to a guy who changes his mind every three minutes? Here we go. All the use of unconventional mediums. Kay, fill me in. Um, I'm all for unconventional. The one risk you run with unconventional is if it hasn't had the old masters doing it way back in, you know, Renaissance period and previously, it's hard to say beyond a shadow of a doubt what's archival and what's not. So if you think about with um, egg tempera and oil paints and acrylics, we know they'll definitely last for this long because there's art out there right now that's lasted for that long. But when we start talking about things like, this is a good example, I don't know, something developed in the last 20 years, it's hard to say this will survive for 500 years, definitely. Because we haven't seen it yet. It's had no proven track record of that. It could, but you're buying a risk. Um, I encourage it, but it's risky. Um, the most longest standing paint in the world though, the number one, goes on and on and on and on, cannot be stopped. The biggest, the goat of all mediums for longevity is acoustic painting. And that's when you literally use beeswax. Now, I've dabbled with it. I can't get the same color and detail with it. It just, it all comes off quite waxy. Um, but, but, beeswax, it's just stable. It lasts forever. And it, what's it got, got? I think it's at like 3,000 years or something. Beeswax is the best. Renaissance artist. It's quite specific. I like the Renaissance movement as a whole, to be fair. I like the fact that a bunch of artists decided like, ah, not into this, let's go back to the perfect forms we were doing. And um, I guess we're kind of having our own little Renaissance here because here we are saying, you know what? I'm tired of the fumes, the chemicals, I'm tired of all the wastage, I'm tired of Honestly, I know I seem like a modern artist. I'm kind of tired of modern art. I want that raw, real, rudimentary art full of feelings. I feel like a lot of art today is mass produced. And that's great. Get art into more people's hands. But the mass produced element behind it doesn't have to be literally everything to do with it. It just, I just, like, um, when I see an artist working on just lines and lines and lines of the same picture. I'm like, I feel like we missed something. I feel like we want to get that personal expression and, and ah, I, don't, I don't know guys, I haven't fully collated my thoughts on it, but uh, I feel like we missed a trick. I feel like we need to go back. We had these great ancient methods which allowed us to give feeling out. Well, actually, healing us and not breaking us those chemicals get me so nervous guys I've had some terrible run-ins with some dangerous fumes and stuff and paint and I just I don't like it guys we don't want to do that to our health we don't need to do that to our health no collector wants that no artist wants that so I'm an egg temper advocate you know that guys I actually need to shrink the brush down a bit, team. Oh, cheers, Kay. Um, but the Renaissance was literally, was literally a return to perfection. So, that's what it means, Renaissance, to go back to perfection. Um, they thought we were doing better stuff beforehand. Um, I'm getting a call here, sorry, guys. Alrighty, Taddy. 
rank one to three. Or oh, now you you felt like I didn't answer that question well enough, so you're trying to pin me down, make me give you proper answers. I feel so routed. Okay, 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 okay. Let's do this. Um, one to three. Da Vinci, Picasso, and Van Gogh being best. Okay. How am I ranking them as an artist or as a creator or as a uh, historical figure? <clears throat> I'll say artist. And if we're ranking them as artists, then that's really interesting because I would say Picasso is more famous. He was very well spoken and he understood how the art world worked. So Picasso is a great historical figure. Da Vinci was an inventor. He made far better inventions. He did make art, but his key was inventions. He was good at that. So I'm going to put Van Gogh as number one because he's the GOAT for all artists anywhere in the world. But actually, we don't have Van Gogh's... Like, Van Gogh just made art and he never got famous, which makes his art even more beautiful. And it wasn't... Uh, there's a book called The Secret Live of Sunflowers or something. I forget. Catching sun, chasing sunflowers. It was Van Gogh's sister-in-law who actually made everyone find Van Gogh's work. No one wanted a bar of him. Um, he was put in front of galleries. He was put in front of famous exhibitions, people. His brother Theo was a dealer who actually always tried to show people Van Gogh. No one wanted him. No one wanted him. So, but then when he died and his brother Theo followed six months after, the entire Van Gogh collection of arts, they were left to, what was her name? Jeepers, I forget her name, but uh, Theo's wife, Van Gogh's sister-in-law, inherited the entire collection and thought, well, I'm now a widow. I need to make money somehow. And all I've got is paintings by my dead brother in law. So she released Van Gogh's letters that Theo meticulously kept and humanized Van Gogh. And when she humanized him, suddenly everyone cared. And what that means is you don't want to be someone beyond humanity that you're just so epic that no one else could touch you. No, no, no. What made Van Gogh a famous artist? was the fact that no one cared when it was just the art. Please look at this, it looks great. People cared when they understood the trauma, the struggles, the thoughts, and the reality of the artist. Once Van Gogh was humanized, there was very personal letters to his brother Theo. Suddenly everyone cared. Because actually Van Gogh wasn't all that crazy. In a small way, we all agree with what Van Gogh was feeling and what, what he was saying. It's your personal favorite. It's your choice how you judge them, then rank them. Crazy relationship with his brother, CC. Personal preference, okay. Well, I feel like we nailed that then. Van Gogh number one, for all those reasons. Picasso number two. Because so I feel like Picasso was more influential in art than Da Vinci. Da Vinci has the most famous painting of all time. But <clears throat> I think if Da Vinci knew that he was remembered as a painter, and not as a philosopher, like so as an inventor, as the wheel of time turned, he might be a little bit gutted. Which is interesting. We're like, does Da Vinci want to be the best painter of all time? No, he wants to be the best inventor of all time. Yet we all forgot what he tried to invent. Go to the Da Vinci Museum and you won't see a whole lot of paintings. You'll see different inventions, flying mechanisms gas mechanisms, underwater mechanisms, things to try and betterment, the betterment of humanity and to do things. He got hired by people to invent like military artillery equipment sort of stuff, not artillery, but like to invent new military equipment and stuff. It's, uh, yeah, he'd be gutted. 
I believe that he'd be gutted to only be remembered as a painter. Yet Van Gogh, all he ever wanted was to be remembered, remembered as a painter. Well now he's one of the only painters worth talking about. Crazy. All right, guys. I reckon, guys, this has been fun, but I might need to run away and get a uh, nice warm shower before I freeze. Or this sweater out today to try and stay warmer, but uh, it's cold. Hello, this follower, Tamara, welcome on in, is from San Francisco. Hope I'm well. Thank you very much. And I appreciate that, High Priest. It's got more to go. A fantastic painting. I have to go to bed. Don't worry, you're missing nothing. I'm about to uh, skedaddle as well. I look forward to it. Until next time. There we go. You gotta let me go. I'm covered in paint. <coughs> I'm gonna go have a nice hot shower, relax, and uh, overcome this little flu. Look after yourselves, guys. Thank you so much for joining in. I'm glad you've enjoyed this painting session. I hope you enjoyed the birds and the lovely last little bits of light we had this evening. Um, it's not just me being soft actually, that sun's about to dip in the next 15 minutes. So this has been fun. Look after yourselves guys and I will see you next time. Bye team.